Hi, I'm Jane Mitchinson Schwartz, and I've been a teacher here at Waterloo Oxford District Secondary School in Ontario, Canada for over 10 years. When I first started teaching, cell phones in the classroom weren't much of an issue. But over the last few years, teens have been bringing them into class, texting, and even integrating the devices into every part of their lives. This raises a lot of questions around relationships, schooling, work, and even brain functions. I took the last year to explore these issues, speaking with experts from around the world, educators, parents, and especially teens. This documentary is the result of that work. When someone's texted me, I have to check it, even if I don't have time to answer. Like, even if it's like I'm driving, I feel it vibrate, I'll just push the button so that it stops. It's a real problem as a teacher because the devices are so small, it's really easy for them to get away with texting while I'm trying to teach. I have friends um, who had a fight over, I texted you, well I didn't get it, well I sent it. They're, they're okay with it because they have been, in effect, conditioned to uh, believe and prefer that, that, that it's okay. All of this, these technologies, the texting and the, the internet and, and the other things, the cell phones, these weren't created for teenagers so that they could hang out electronically with their friends. You need your phone. You need it. You can't go like an hour without it. It's interesting the panic that Emily encounters when she, for five seconds, does not know where her phone Where's is. Where's my phone, Daddy? Where's my phone? Like, it's, it's outright panic. I need to call my phone. I don't know where my phone is. And she just had it in her hand. Like, she's worried she's lost it somewhere. That, that sort of intensification of, of connectedness, which, yes, it has all sorts of positive emotional benefits to it. But, yes, potentially the danger is that that we, that we can't deal with being disconnected. She always has it with her, watching a TV show or whatever. It's always with her. It sits beside her pillow. She, when she wakes up with it in her hand. I can't say there's a lot I like about it because it does take up so much of her time mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, she's not allowed to use it at the table or anything like that when we're eating. So, she, and she respects that. Where does it start to eat into your other lives, your student life, your home life, your friend life, and, and your sports life, you know, and all of these other things. And then when you have that kind of a, a discussion, you can start to see where the boundaries need to be set. And it's going to be for a case-by-case -case basis. Does texting affect Emily's homework at all? No. No. She's a hard worker. Yeah. I could imagine it affecting Matthews. Mm -hmm. So Emily, even though she's, you know, she spends a lot of time doing schoolwork, I do know she's answering texts and stuff like that, but she's focused on her schooling, so I'm not worried about that. She can handle it very well. But Matthew, that's why you're putting it off, waiting for yes. business? Well, I just, yeah, I think it's just going to be one more distraction for somebody who doesn't need any more distractions. Yeah. And this is one of the frustrations. People want to have blanket rules. Well, it doesn't even work in a whole family. Sometimes different children are going to have to have different rules because their lifestyles are a little different or they're two years apart or whatever. You touched on some rules around texting, particularly uh, no texting at the table. Are there any other types of rules that you have around uh, I think if we're with the company or I, I sometimes, you know, just depending on the situation, we'll say like, you're not, don't text right now. But I do know that it is stressful for her not to have that time to text back if she hears something coming in and she can't check it. So even at dinner time, if it, if it vibrates or whatever, she'll look at it. Well, she won't she necessarily go respond no. to it right away, Emily. but she does look at it because she needs to know what Put it, it is. Put it in the way now. Put it in the pocket. No. But it's creating an environment of impatient kids because they can't wait for anything. And yeah. if she asks me, Oh. <laughs> she, she'll text me something and obviously I'm up at work or something and I can't respond because I'm with a client. She has to wait. Well, it'll go off again. And again. And, and, you're, and you're not answering me. 
one of the big reasons why kids get mobile phones, for example, in the first place, is so that their parents can, well, partly keep track of them, but also partly just feel connected to them. And so, you know, yes, there are many positives to that. I do like the fact that she can communicate with me and yes. let me know I'm home now or I'm at, I'm at the mall or can you pick me up, um, which is a lot to, well, I guess it reduces the anxiety, I guess. But there is a bit of a risk of it being oppressive and becoming competitive. To hear that her kid, or her friends are upset that she's not responding, that's, uh, that's a little concerning, actually. Yeah. So as you're saying, you know, kids worrying about where they are in the friends list, you know, and, and that sense of, yeah, if you're not constantly available, you've got to be kind of perpetually in contact. So you've got to go to bed with your mobile phone. You know, you mustn't, if somebody's, is, is somebody's I, IMing you, you must respond instantly, otherwise it's rude. And, you know, so there's a whole new sense of, of really com the compulsion to communicate, you know, compulsory connectivity.